Hi, this is Mike Balson. Of course, this is one of my video PowerPoint presentations. This is part two of the righteous judgment of God. And as I always, or I should say lately, my, my uh, sermons, my commentaries, my studies are a pause and study where I highly suggest that you pause when you come to some verses and you look them up in your Bible as well. That's one of the things I did when I was in the state of Washington as a pastor. I would give the time and I would insist that people would take the time right then and there. Let's look up the verse. Let me show you in your Bible the verses that we're talking about here. Don't just believe me. Don't just believe the reference title, the, you know, what, what book and chapter verse it is. Look them up. Make sure that that's what I'm saying is true and what you're reading is true. And so you can have your confidence and faith in your Bible, in your King James 1611 Bible, not in me or in your pastor or any of those other modern Bibles or videos or Bible studies or your favorite musician or whatever. So let's get into this part two here. The righteous judgment of God according to the truth of Apostle Paul's gospel. Now, you all should know by now that I teach Paul's greater commission. I call it the greater commission to the unto the ends of the earth, it says in Acts 13, emphasizing the goodness of God, not the severity of God, but the goodness of God during today's latter times in the dispensation of the grace of God, but as we are drawing nearer and nearer to the last days. It's amazing what's going on out there. Rightly dividing the word of truth in the King James Bible as told to us by Paul. And these are Bible presentations as well as Bible studies and sermons and lately commentaries included from a King James Bible, all taught to us by the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, my question to you is, do you read and study what Christ said after he rose again? Why do people and pastors cons insist on teaching and studying and trying to apply what Jesus taught to the Jews in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 1 through 8, and Hebrews through Jude? Those are all things taught before Christ was even glorified. Anyway, to get back to the subject here, because that's, that's just one of my my concentrated points I want people to get. You know, you believe Jesus Christ died and rose again. So many people believe that. But most of those people just ignore what Jesus teaches and taught and said after he rose again and went to the Gentiles through Paul. Okay, part two, the righteous judgment of God. This is a pause and study. You know, if you remember, and I hope you've seen it, we began part one by scripturally identifying the people that are religiously confused or believe they can deny, ignore, reject, mock, scoff, or in some way or another think they can escape the judgment of God in their own way or in their own belief. As it says in Romans chapter 2, 1 and 2, Therefore thou art excusable, O man, Whosoever thou art that judgest, for when, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. See, this is not written to a Christian. I know a lot of pastors like to put, or your friends or family, like to put that on you for being so judgmental. This is not written to us as, as Christians, as quickened. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So we're looking at the judgment of God. So we're looking at here. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing, they don't know this, pastors aren't teaching this, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So we're looking at today, part two, judgment from a just and holy God. In part two, now we will learn specifics about the judgment of God. We will fully understand how those same people will not escape the judgment of God. And then as a bonus, you will learn how to truly escape the judgment of God yourself, if you haven't already put yourself in that position. 
Let's move on now after part one, which is a rather lengthy study of all the different people that reject God. Let's move on now, look at the main chunk of what this study commentary is all about, and that is verses 5 through 11. The righteous judgment of God. There is no respect of persons with God. That's why it's called the righteous judgment of God. He, God, is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. And by the way, studying the word rock is a fantastic study. Okay, let's get back to the subject here. I have to do one of those sometimes. So here's what got us started on this particular series through the righteous judgment of God. At your first reading here, you would think that in order for anyone to go to heaven after they die, they must have been doing a bunch of good, godly works, have a general belief in God, be a church-going person, been water baptized, partaken in communion somewhere, confirmed with a love to worship with all kinds of music, ignoring doctrinal differences, being led by the Spirit of God, by your own feelings and conclusions. And of course, you still need that confession time. That's what you would think by reading this, the judgment of God. And you'll see, if you haven't read this chapter, you will see, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. So when you read that, and you don't understand the rest of Romans, and about Paul, and rightly divided, you would think, that that sure looks like I've got to be doing the right thing if I want to be going to heaven when I finally when I finally die. That's what it looks like. Let's look at this where he says of the Jew first, Jews Israel of the Jews Israel first. Well, Jeremiah was on these on the people's case back in the Old Testament because they rejected the word of the Lord. Therefore, I said, surely these are poor; they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord nor the judgment of their God. This is what Jeremiah, that was his main message, that they're rejecting the words of the Lord. And by the way, this is exactly what's going on in the Gentile nation today, as Paul warns. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, which he spake by the prophet Jeremiah. Now, also of the Gentiles, which, by the way, the Gentiles today, they were the heathen in the Old Testament. That was us by the way, okay. If any man teach otherwise, Paul says, and that's in verse couple of verses there in, uh, in Timothy, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, see, that's the risen Christ words, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, which is only taught by Paul, and can only be found in a King James Bible, by the way. This is what God says about these people that reject the words of the risen Savior. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. And that's what pastors all through the country and world are teaching. You know, if, you, if you're getting gain, if you're being blessed, then you're a godly Christian. And Paul does tell us to with, from such withdraw thyself. Pretty tough stuff. Get away from it's our friends and family there in most cases. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. However, so if we think that we have to do the right thing to get God's judgment on our side or such, however, by us looking to the teachings of the risen Christ through the Apostle Paul, in a rightly divided King James 1611 Bible, we can certainly and joyfully learn that God's judgment is not applicable to us today. That's quite a statement, and I'll show you that during this study. Now, to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, that's Paul talking, 
my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ as the risen Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, and that's Paul's ministry, that's the New Testament, which was kept secret since the world began. And this is all looking to the risen Savior through Paul in the King James Bible. It was kept secret all that time. Remember, this is just a review from part one. The judgment of God has always remained the same since the beginning of time. It still is the same today and always will be. Let's just review this. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So don't get confused. I always have to say this. He has not chosen us. The chosen people are the Jews, but he chose us that we should be holy and without blame. That was what he created. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, he made this declaration at the very beginning that we should be holy and without blame. If we want to be before him, we have to be holy and without blame. And we learn from Paul that Christ makes us and keeps us holy and without blame on the inside. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? And see, our judgment seat of Christ as a Christian will take care of those outside works later. So we will be fully blameless and holy. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not referring to the rapture. That's referring to the coming of Jesus Christ after the tribulation. So as we come back with him, that's what that teaches in Revelation, that we will be completely holy, spirit, soul, and body, completely blameless. It's amazing stuff. However, the difference during today's dispensation of the grace of God and following Christ's death and resurrection, Christ himself actually pays for our, that's the heathen Gentile, he actually pays for our sin and sins and takes God to judgment upon himself for us. So God's design, because he is a holy and just God, is that we should be holy and without blame. And Christ makes us that way. It's the only dispensation this takes place in. In other words, the risen Christ makes us free. The risen Christ makes us holy and without blame. We don't have to suddenly think we have the power of Jesus to go out and live a holy and blameless life in our daily walk. Because we can't, we won't. Our, our, the flesh that's in us, the sin that's in us will not let us. Christ has to take care of that stuff. Oh, I wish I could get people to see that. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. So all these pastors are teaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Christ hadn't even died yet. That's still Old Testament doctrine, Old Testament uh, teachings. Jews had to live to that. Christ even told the apostles, do not take these things that I'm saying to the Gentiles. One final reminder, this can all be true for you, but only if you have put your faith and trust in and on the risen Savior. Truth, we are able to escape Satan's deceitfully subtle physical and spiritually seductive snares and darts that are found in false man-made religions of good works and self-righteousness, rituals, confessions, water baptisms, communion Communion rituals, wafers, inner false anointed feelings, signs, wonders, and miracles as taught by fancy, evil seducing preachers and pastors with their good words and fair speeches from the many denominations who are all following over 400 plus various modern Bible versions. That's a heavy duty statement. You can learn so much in what was stated in that paragraph. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you have that Word of God in your hand so you can read it and study it? That if thou shalt confess of thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10. Who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And I have complete sermons on that verse. Those verses are marvelous verses. However, if you think you are able to escape Satan's deceitfully subtle physical and spiritual seductive snares and darts by, one, following your false man-made religions of good works and self-righteousness, rituals, confessions, baptisms, communal rituals. See, I'm saying them again. Have you noticed that? Communion, rituals, wafers, inner false anointed feelings. Boy, there's a lot of that today. Signs, wonders, and miracles. That's getting more and more popular. As taught by fancy, evil, seducing preachers and pastors with their good words and fair speeches from the many denominations who are all following over 400 various modern Bible versions. If you think you're going to go to escape Satan's deceitfully snares and darts by that, or ignoring it all and living life and the ways of the world to the fullest, eat, drink, and be merry, or simply rejecting God totally. If you think that's how you're going to escape, you will be without excuse. Romans chapter 1 talks about that, and I've talked about that. Having become vain in your imaginations with a darkened foolish heart, professing yourself to be wise, but becoming fools, serving the creature, that's yourself, more than the creator, living unto vile affections, and that's what we see just going on today. It's just vile, all these unnatural things about gender, et cetera, et cetera. Living into vile affections. Yeah, Paul, Paul talks about that in Romans chapter one, how this stuff all came about. It's amazing if you have never read that. Romans chapter one, King James Bible. Receiving in yourselves that recompense of your own error with a God-given reprobate mind, now being a person who at one time knew the judgment of the very living God through the risen Jesus Christ you are rejecting, if that's you, you will be without excuse. You are worthy of death because you are dead in your sins. That's just the way it is. And then Paul says in Romans chapter 2, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. See, this whole thing about the judgment of God, we see what the judgment of God is. We see that God has always stated that we must be holy and without blame to be before him. And he applies that right now, even to the lost people. He does not put any severity of God. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. He doesn't put any day-to-day -day judgment on anybody lost or saved. The saved, as we're seeing here, the ones that are quickened, are made holy and blameless by Christ himself to us. He gives us his faith. But a lost person, somebody who is, who is not quickened, the moment you die, you will, you will be going to your judgment which is not like the Christian judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. You will be going to the white throne judgment. And all those things that you've done will still be attached so as such to you because you were dead in your sins. And like Christ says, you are worthy of death. It's just you're worthy of that. You're without excuse. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So when you see these lost, unquickened, religious, whatever people laughing at you, you just, just look at them and remember, they are storing this stuff up. They are storing up their evil works. They are storing up their sins for their judgment when it does come. It will come. Who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor in immortality, eternal life, 
but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. And of course, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. So what have we done? We have put our faith and trust in Christ and on Christ, and Christ makes us holy. Religious people think you've got to do your best to be holy and blameless day by day, and when you mess up, you got to go to confession. See, that is a false religion. That is not the teachings of the risen Savior. Okay, something else. Because of the goodness of God that is taught only by Paul, and found only in a King James 1611 Bible. I sure hope that these verses and these pages has, uh, in the study commentary, has brought you to a new level of biblical and scriptural understanding and awareness. Or, like I've been saying here, you maybe just need to receive that new beginning with a, with a soul-saving quickening in your life, based on what you have just learned from the risen Christ through Paul, is found only in the King James 1611 Bible, and in this particular study about the judgment of God. Nobody's living under the severity of God today. We're living under the goodness of God today, a lost person as well. It's just that the lost person, when he dies, he will be worthy of death because he will have died in his sins. And what and we may, Christians who are quickened, may be worthy of death, but we're not because Christ paid the price. He paid it all. He took our sins upon him. So we are holy and without blame. And we have to go through judgment seat of Christ to take care of our works. First Corinthians. Remember, it is not the severity of God that will lead you or anyone else to repentance today. It is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. And it is a peaceful and excitingly joyful repentance. It's not one of those you got to live this perfect Christian life and be miserable. It is a peaceful and excitingly joyful repentance with the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the peace of God that passeth all understanding. It's a growing process. It's maturing as a Christian. However, during the coming time of great tribulation, this marvelous goodness of God ends. It will not be there. And the severity of God will return. From what I've been watching lately, these last couple of years, I do believe that this time of great tribulation appears to be coming sooner than we ever realized before. It's coming up on the horizon. We can see it, feel it, and almost smell it. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. You think things are tough. It's, it's coming. It's some serious stuff. That will be when the severity of God returns. Right now, living under the goodness of God and the judgment of God, so people don't get confused, it has always been that we should be holy and without blame, blameless. So Christ goes to the Gentiles through Paul, and those that put their faith in him and on him are made holy and blameless. And then eventually, when we die, we have to go to our judgment seat of Christ, where our works will be judged, but not us, because we are not dead in our sins. We are dead to sin. It's gone. Sin is not possible. Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, fantastic studies. I've done them before. They're available. Marvelous stuff. Alas, be comforted today. The goodness of God is still in place for us and to us, during this dispensation of the grace of God. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. This is one of the most exciting verses in the Bible. Because that can be proven without a shadow of doubt that that which is perfect has come. So all that that was done in part, which is what everybody's doing in their churches and religions today, is all done away. That which is perfect, it came in 1611. And Paul knew this was coming. It's an amazing thing. Paul knew that, that which, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part, it'll be done away. So we're living in a time when all that stuff 
the tongues, the knowledge out of the blue, and uh, uh, and prophesy, just God giving your preaching to yourself, which is what everybody talks about today. That's done. That's gone. No longer today. Signs, miracles, wonders, all that stuff is gone. It's in that King James Bible. That's which is perfect. Unfortunately, we're also warned. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but that is coming, we are noticing in the news, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That famine is already here, it seems like. Pastors don't preach it. Preachers don't preach it. People don't have one. People don't want one. People got all these modern Bibles, and they're throwing those out, and they're just going by feelings led of God, based on John 14, but they're rejecting the King James Bible based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and they're still living a life where they know things in part, but actually they don't know anything because that stuff was done away. If you want the truth and the leading of the Holy Spirit from God, you go to that King James Bible. As you read and divide, write to divide that thing, you will find out that you are, right now at this moment, approved unto God if you have the risen Savior. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. See, today you still can find it. You come to my website or get yourself a King James Bible. And if you can't find one someplace, you want a Bible with no notes in it. You want a Bible with no references, no Greek junk in there. Just a text-only Bible. And I can show you how you can get them. They're inexpensive and they're pretty decent quality. They still are available, but it's getting hard. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst, thirst of the truth, thirst from the word of God. Okay, one more time, and I will tell it to you. It won't be last. Okay, one more time, and I will tell you it won't be my last. But it is so incredibly important to understand the scriptures. That while we realize Genesis to Revelation was all written for all of us, according to Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, we must also realize and remember that God is directing Paul's books to the Gentiles, that's us, to the heathen, that's what the Gentiles were in the Old Testament, and that's what we are, the heathen, the Gentiles unless you're saved, quickened, then you're the church of God, not the denomination, by the way. Oh, I ramble so much here. Romans eleven thirteen. 13. So I speak to you Gentiles. This is Paul talking. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, not Peter, not the 12 apostles, not those guys. They are Jewish apostles. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, Galatians chapter 2. Peter is apostle to the circumcision, Paul is an apostle to the uncircumcision, Galatians chapter 2. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and why not? He doesn't say Jesus, he says Christ. Christ is the risen Jesus, Jesus Christ. I speak the truth in Christ, and why not? A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul is our teacher. You will only find Paul's teachings in a King James Bible because the modern Bibles change so many doctrines and verses in there. It's unreal. Or until I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, he says it again in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And that also includes those who think the judgment of God is not fair or even believe that it's not true. We see that the judgment of God is fair and includes everyone, whether you believe it or not. The simple and obvious truth is that during today's dispensation of the grace of God, God provided himself and gave us the option to stand before him on our own terms or to put our faith and trust on him and let him take our judgment himself. Don't wait until it is too late because then you will have no choice. You will stand before God dead in your trespasses and sins. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? I'm telling you, pastors today do not teach that. They preach and teach the severity of God, full of guilt in their sermons, 
Oh, I could just ramble. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. There was a time that I was dead in my sins, but Christ quickened me with him. See? I'm holding without blame. Now I've got to go through my judgment seat to judge my day-to-day -day works. They're not sins, they're works. They're, whether they be, you know, good or bad, we we'll study that sometime. Basically, it's all based on Paul's teachings, by the way. Oh, I could, like I say, I could just talk and talk on this stuff. For by grace are you saved, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. And remember, that which is perfect, it came in 1611. It was, still is, and always will be, no matter what their scholars say, no matter what your pastors say, no matter what manuscript evidence they claim, no matter what they say for contradictions and stuff, for wrongly dividing the scriptures, they are preaching profane and vain babblings. That which is perfect is the King James 1611 Bible. And if anybody's teaching you about uh, God showing you things because you're so special, you are anointed. That's another sermon I'm working on. That anointing is the Bible. It's not us. The anointing comes later. Oh, no, people are so deceived today. Anyway, that which is perfect came in 1611. It was, still is, and always will be the King James 1611 Bible and whether you believe it or not.